Well, the verdict now handed down just over 12 hours ago, but already a lot of conversation surrounding the sentencing. That is what comes next in the justice of all of this. You see right there our legal analyst Latoya Williams Shelton. She joins us this morning. We appreciate you waking up with us again, Latoya. It's been quite a week. Let's talk about what's going on right now at this point. Uh, the courthouse yesterday, so many people are outside saying they hope this is just a start to a change in how use of force cases can be handled moving forward. Do you think that we'll actually see a shift? I, I definitely think so. I definitely think that it has set the tone of how we need to evaluate these cases in the future. Latoya, good morning to you. Lou Turner here with you. I, I, I'm curious good morning. From, for your take here. Ten hours of deliberation to reach that unanimous decision on all three counts. Seemed like a really, really long time. Were you surprised by the length of it? Short, long? What, what were your take on the uh, amount of time the jury had to deliberate? You know, everybody asked that, and, and, and I've said, I think, several times that you just never know when it comes to a jury. But what I've also said, too, is that a lot of times these jurors already have somewhat of an opinion. They've already formed somewhat of an opinion as to how they're going to rule. I want to go back and also restate that I believe that the state did a very good job in their closing arguments of just laying out exactly what they needed to consider. This has been a long time for them, a long road. They have a pure or a clear and concise summary of the things that they need to consider. That you know They got some things from the defense, but as I said before, I think that was a little confusing. And Based on that, they, they came to, you know, the proper conclusion of the proper verdict. You know, um, Latoya, I was entrenched in coverage yesterday, like so many people were as well, trying to figure out what happens next, right? We still need to get through the sentencing phase. So let's get to the max, maximum sentence we could see uh, handed down to Derek Chauvin, as well as the least amount of time mm -hmm. that he faces. Give us a, a breakdown. What can we expect? Right. So that, that that part is a little confusing, especially for us as Floridians, right? Because we're thinking about Florida law. And that was even something that I had to correct myself on. And so, of course, you've already stated in Minnesota, those charges are going to be merged into one. And he's only going to be sentenced based on the one most serious charge, which is the second degree murder charge, right? So, of course, that second degree murder charge carries a maximum of 40 years. He scores or his guidelines are 12 and a half. So as we go into sentencing, what the defense is going to be arguing is that we need to stay at the guidelines. We need to stay somewhere around this 12 and a half years. This is what um, we need to stay at. This is what he should be sentenced to. As far as the state is concerned, the state is going to be talking about those aggravating factors and asking the judge to enhance that sentence. And as I've learned, those aggravating factors that they're going to be talking about are, one, the fact that Floyd was handcuffed and he was particularly vulnerable. Uh, two, he was treated with a particular cruelty. Three, Derek Chauvin abused his authority. Mm -hmm. And number four, these, this was committed in front of children. So what you're going to hear is evidence that the state has already provided now because sentencing is not like a new trial, but things that are factors that evidence and factors that were already presented to the jury and the reason why they came down with these guilty verdicts. These were factors that were considered. These are aggravating factors. Based on these aggravating factors, you as the judge should enhance the sentence above or somewhere above the guidelines between 12 and a half and 40 years. You know, after the sentencing, I know we're all kind of honed in on Chauvin's face. What's his reaction going to be? And so tough to kind of judge it considering, you know, he's wearing a mask there. But Correct. there was a, a little moment picked up by some of the cameras there in the courtroom mm -hmm. after sentencing. Uh, something written on Chauvin's hand appearing to be a, a phone number. And then also as he's walking out in handcuffs, as, as his bail is, of course, removed, now he's found guilty, nodding towards his attorney, uh, almost as if, okay, I understand, going to be okay, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see the close up there. Now, this all, I know it's normal. An appeal is going to be a normal part of the process. So, I mean, obviously, do you think we can anticipate that uh, coming down the line as well? I mean, quite possibly. Yeah. Of course, you heard some of the arguments the defense provided in his motion for a mistrial. Um, of course, we've talked about comments by Maxine Waters, some of the comments from the state. I mean, and in this case, as a defense attorney, you do look for any way or any uh, option to possibly appeal the case if that's what you want to do. As far as him writing down his attorney's number, it's it's 
it's something that he knows he's going, he's being taken into custody right now. So he wants to make sure that he has his number because nine times out of 10, he's thinking about what's next. We truly need to talk about what's next. We need to talk about what happens if I'm sentenced to this. We need to talk about what happens if I sentence to that and if we're going to appeal this. And again, that's truly a conversation that he has to have with his counsel about uh, the success or the possible success of an appeal.